you, oh, if you um, look at the uh, mid-range projection uh, with a uh, with a storm, uh, if you look at a high projection, um, it's 4.6 feet. If you look at this mid-range projection with uh, with an extreme storm, it's actually 6.4 feet. And if you combine them all together and you say, what is what do we have to really pay attention to in, in terms of what is possible that could wreak havoc um, in a bad storm a la Katrina um, in an era of sea level rise in San Francisco Bay, you're really talking about eight feet. Yeah. Um, the planning people, when they were here, uh, told us that already San Francisco Bay has risen one and a half, almost two feet. And during king tides, that's very obvious because the water goes over the seawall and across the Embarcadero and, is, and has been known to lap up against the buildings on the west side of the Embarcadero roadway already. Uh, I, and, it, and we're just now getting into the beginning signs of what is forecasted to come, and we're already seeing water that our seawall can't stop. And they do all, one other piece of that was on the news on Channel 7 not too long ago, where they go to, go to do repairs on the uh, foundations of the piers. They used to have six to eight hours between low tide and high tide. Now they only have four, because this water level in the bay has risen two feet and it has taken out there, taken out two and a half hours of repair time hmm. on fixing the sub the substructure of our of our piers. I, I hadn't heard that figure. Um, it's on what, ABC Seven News. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, nation or or uh, uh, worldwide, the average is like ten inches so far or, uh, since pre-industrial levels. Um, but if it's if well, it's, they were talking about king tides. Yeah, so. yeah, no. But if if it's if it's more in San Francisco Bay, I would believe it because of the dynamics of the bay, the bay doesn't act exactly uh, I, I that way. I would check with ABC7news.com. It's a good tip. Um, yeah. I, I just was wondering, just sea level rising and what, the city planners and those persons who are involved with putting all the things together in San Francisco, including the new construction that are going up, I wonder why they couldn't see this before now. Why, is it, why all of a sudden are you hearing about sea risings and and water crashing against walls. Why, why couldn't you, could you like, when you set up things, you, like, you, 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 you can also look at the variable or the possibility of something going wrong, right? You look at that, because water is strong in itself, and you know, it can weaken foundations. And since we just don't have that ability to beat all that and some chips, you, you think that they already had something to play the plan just in case. Mm -hmm. Right, but no one seemed to think. Of. Well, it's you know, the, I th what's really interesting about the Bay Area is there are no, there, there you know, as opposed to other regions of the country, there are very few climate change deniers. Um, there, there, there are very few people who say it's not happening at all. Uh, there's a lot of people who say yes, it's happening, but it's not. It's probably not going to be as bad as as the as the chicken littles are saying, and it's not going to affect me. Um, and 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 so one of the things. That um, that we did was we did our own mapping project to really look in detail at where the areas of vulnerability are and match that up uh, with the the plans for development across the region um, because there's kind of like these two separate ideas about about our waterfront right one one idea is an environmental idea which is um, we need to treat. Uh, the, the, the waterfront as a uh, as this kind of uh, uncertain permeable barrier um, that that will change with the climate and another one is there's a lot of really valuable land there that's underdeveloped and there's a race right now to develop as much as fast as possible on the waterfront and really what it's come down to is a race between the environmental regulators and the developers and the developers are winning uh, they're building massive amounts of new new developments, residential, uh, uh, industrial, and, and and largely offices, also entertainment complexes, um, and and there are very few legal uh, you know uh, strong legal uh, uh, tools that local governments can use, and the and there's and 
there's also not very much willingness to use the tools that they've got. Um, so we found that all around the Bay, we added up um, all of the acreage um, that's currently under development in this eight foot flood zone. And it's about 5,100 acres, uh, 20, 27 projects adding up to $21 billion worth of development costs. Um, and that includes Treasure Island, Mission Bay, uh, the Facebook and Google campuses, um, Jack London Square, uh, Pier 70, which is going to have a whole big housing uh, development. Um, and, and, and there's actually more and more. Every, every month there's an announcement. Did you mention the island? Um, yeah, yeah, Treasure, Treasure Island, they're going to build uh, uh, approximately 8,000 units and put, with, with housing 12,000 people. Um, and they've already, they've already broken ground on this. And it's going, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, person at the Bay Conservation Development Commission, the agency that kind of most closely tracks it, said, yeah, it's going to be a levee protected community. Um, and, and that's kind of like what New Orleans is right now. Um, and if the, and, and um, but but the engineers are saying, oh well, we've got technical fixes to this. If sea level gets higher, we'll just build the, the levees higher, um, and it's going to be a kind of inverted bathtub. Yeah. Um, I hate being the problem <laughs> one here, but um, or sea level rise has been a project I've worked on um, as a reviewer of land use development, and right now I've got upstairs five or six EIRs for over 4,000 housing units right along the waterfront. Let's uh, talk these after. are 30, 40, 50 story buildings. And these and are currently? Uh, one of my, this are currently in the, in the planning process. And I get paperwork every week on a new project coming on. Um, and one of my biggest problems I have is not just what sea level rise is going to do at the coastline, what sea level rise is going to do to groundwater because there's a lot of areas of San Francisco that are on what we call landfill, which used to be Bay, bay Marsh or just plain Bay. And um, what that, what the water level rise will do to 50 year old, 100 year old foundations and the new projects, I mean, we're building 40 story buildings on Van Ness and Mission. We're building 30, 40 story buildings in the mission. These, this is not the areas these buildings this is designed to hold these kind of buildings. But now to get to plug the land use people who are at City Hall making all these decisions about where things go, knowing that these buildings are not supposed to be built in those levels or being not allowed to be built anyway, that's that says a lot about the, the, the um, politics of this, of this, of this state. Absolutely. Call, take the money and run. Yeah, the developers have millions of dollars. See, just take it because they have money. It's obvious, right? You, you're working in a restaurant, people don't come ask for food. They don't come ask for a brand new car. And, and the fact is, is that the, the housing that's being built on, on land that doesn't belong there, it, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't make any darn sense at all. Well, it, this, is a, this is an area, this is kind of a new area of public debate. And one of the, you know, one of the problems is that we can't even agree about about this, about where, about uh, what the what the coastline is going to look like. Have you talked to anybody in City Hall about all these things? Language we we have. If you read our issue on, on sea level rise, you will, we interviewed about forty people in, in city government, um, and uh, and everybody's kind of at a different place in terms of where they. Th where they think, what, what they think we need to do, how fast, and what it'll take to really deal with the issue. Um, the, the big issue now is whether we're gonna start regulating private developments in the same way that we're planning for public investment. Public investments like you know sewers and, and seawalls and stuff like that, and, and sewage treatment plants, that's only about you know less than 5% of the, of the total infrastructure that's going in, the vast majority, are, are all of these, um, are, are uh, ho housing projects in, in Candlestick Point and Mission Bay um, and, and, and you know, at Treasure Island, it's billions and billions of dollars of, of, of private development. Um, are we ever going to have, a, is there ever going to be a time when uh, local governments agree all around the Bay 
about how to regulate private property um, and to, to zone uh, for flood risk, future flood risk, not current flood risk. Um, and, and, and what you're getting into about like even, even beyond this, you know, this sort of Maginot line here, um, the, 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 the water seepage is going to go I far, like far inland. I heard that. <laughs> um, and it's like Miami. Miami has very porous soil. We don't know what's going to happen because this has never happened. It's unprecedented. Every once in a while, there's a sinkhole the size of a bus and bigger. That's what's going on in Florida. Right, yeah. Well, one, one of the things I know we have here is we have politicians that are not willing to stand up and do what needs to be done to solve the problem. There's too much money out there, um, and uh, there's too many people who have the hands in that pie. And until we can get a regional consensus by the people who can set policy, we're just going to have piecemeal. And piecemeal is only going to make the problem worse and not make it better. And that's where, the, that's where people can come in because the citizens who will be impacted the most can, in effect, at the ballot box, say who makes the policy. But the people haven't done it yet. Well, here's what I say about that. I believe that the government is not the people that sit in those offices. They are the ones who are working for us. We are the ones that are paying their paychecks. But they're not being held accountable, maybe, maybe responsible for their actions. Yeah, and, and a lot of this stuff seems really obscure to people who, who have, don't have access to technical reports and, or, or who aren't uh, obsessed with looking at uh, environmental impact reports. You know. Uh, and and, re and really kind of you know watchdogging the government, um, but it, uh, it's the information's out there. It's just very hard to get and synthesize and put together in a way that helps people make choices. And so that's that's what we're trying to cool. do as an organization. There, there's a lot of people in the there's a lot of people who vote and are politically powerful groups of people, like the the the, the that want to see development. Not, not just rich people. There's carpenters, the, 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 lay, the building trades unions, people who own property and would like very much to sell it at a higher price than it's, it's worth right now. And those, those people, then you know, that's where the political balance is right now. There's a lot of people who don't want their lifestyle or their future vision of what their retirement is going to be like. They don't want it to change in their lifetime. They want to push it just the way we're doing things now, push it just a little bit further along. Let the next generation figure it out. Look for the greater fool. So it, it isn't just rich. Oh, you know, you bring up a really good, a really good point, which is that it's not it's not just developers who have stake in this. It's local governments that get tax money out of development. Out of property development, and so they they are they are sort of um, you could say perversely in, incentivized to approve these things because because in the short term. They benefit, um, and the, and the community benefits. They can you know they can put pour that money back into schools and streets and whatever. Um, so the so the real, so the question really is, what standards do we use? How how cautious do we want to be about far off future uh, problems um, when we have problems today? It's 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 a really legitimate question that 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 I don't have the answer to, but hopefully together we will. Okay, okay, most of the people that would be living right close to the shore would be very low-income people, that's, that's okay, right. who do not have much choice. And, of course, the, you know, then it, it's due that, you know, are they going to have to worry about 10 years down the road, 20 year, years down the road? Um, they, okay, they don't have, okay, uh, since it's the, gov the city government or state governments that are, that are philanthropy that have, put the money down to make those developments so close to so much possible flooding, um, it's, it's like um, they're good, they can like lose everything they have in a, in a, in a, in a heartbeat. There, there's been some, some really good, um, there's been some really good journalism on this over the last couple of, uh, about, over the last two years. Uh -huh. um, there's an organization called New America Media 
um, that uh, specializes in aggregating the ethnic press. Um, and they actually did a they actually did a study of the demographics of the people who would be most affected. Um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of really good stuff. And, and if you want more information, I can I can share it. Um, and, and and I think the important thing is to spread the information to all these people. Hey, if, if you move in, here, you know this is this is what you know this is what's going to happen, you know. And if people, ha you know, are really thoroughly told exactly what's going to happen. You know, they might be incentivized, or not incentivized, that's the wrong motivated not to move into those places. That, yeah, it's, it's the, there's, um, having the information gives you both the, the personal choices as a, as a consumer of, uh -huh. of, of housing and, and, um, and where you want to locate your family, as well as what you want to do collectively, politically. Um, I have a couple more, so, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, because I have about six more slides. We've got another hour or so. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, I didn't want to take up all your meeting. Um, Share us with something else that's totally messed up now. Love it. Give us another, oh, okay. another area of work. Totally well, <laughs> it's, you, you're the only you presenter can, tonight. So. Okay, well, thank you for. for you can indulging. display graphically. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, what was failing here is the term of the words government for by of the people. Um, it's meant to be, it's meant to be disregarded and non and non fought non fought of anymore. It's all about the ones who got money and clout. Well, and it's, and it's uh, uh, I, I will let you draw the conclusions about about what uh, you think the next steps are. Actually, he actually see it. And you know, Ray Charles was here. He was here. So, <laughs> move my mouth. <laughs> so the, the flip side to this is not just sea level rise, but with the climate changing, which is creating the sea level rise, we're getting worse typhoons on the east side of the Pacific. We're getting uh, monster rainstorms going across this country. Uh, we're getting exceptional drought in places that don't usually have drought. Uh, we're getting we're getting more La Ninas and less El Ninos along the uh, equatorial borderline. This is affecting the worldwide weather pattern. Which, is, which also affects how we grow our crops, how much crops we can grow, the cost of our food. All this is all being factored in. And um, as the demographics from out here grow, it's, I know over the past probably six or seven years, San Francisco and the Bay Area has grown so much that what they used to consider the boondocks, which was Antioch, is now the boondocks east of Fairfield, and Antioch is downtown. Well, there, um, and it's just the absolute amount of growth. But also, it's the fees collected by the cities, because developers pay transit fees, sewer fees, I mean, millions of dollars of fees, which go into the coffers of city government to provide services to people and supposedly restructure the infrastructure. Yeah, we've done reporting on uh, the issue of uh, suburban sprawl, and um, some, there are some agencies that, that have um, a really uh, sort of comprehensive vision about how to address that as, as, a, as an issue of what, imp, what, imp, what inputs go into our contribution to climate change. Um, and so there's the, the Plan Bay Area, which is working on an idea for regional cooperation among uh, all of the counties and cities in, in, in the Bay Area. And so they have this plan um, called Priority Development Areas, uh, which basically create transit villages along public transit lines so that, to, so that they can get people out of their cars, create walkable communities, and this is all supposed to in, in, you know, in the next couple of decades, reduce the amount of emission from transportation. Um, yeah. Sorry. Oh. I, I think um, why something changed because uh, um, two meeting, two meeting, uh, San Francisco, two uh, like now too many building and uh, people uh, move to here too much. Uh, otherwise, uh, something terrible and the world. 
a chance something like uh, last uh